so glad you are here. Today we are talking about tinnitus, or tinnitus, whatever is more comfortable for you to say. Not only about that, but how to apply some strategies to your life, regardless of your diagnosis. This is what I want to focus on. Having a plan for things in our life is important. Whether it's a recipe for a cake, yes, that's a plan, or a plan to do something that scares you due to symptoms that you think you might have. What do you think the most challenging part of having a plan is? I'll tell you, action. And today we're going to learn that doing things that scare us and habituating to your tinnitus can happen for you. It's not just for a select few. You can do this. Welcome to the Meniere's Muse podcast. Whether you're listening for yourself or a loved one, or maybe someone sent this to you feeling you needed to hear this valuable information, thank you for listening and making this podcast a special one in the vestibular community, bringing hope and inspiration to vestibular warriors through the power of connection. I was inspired to reach out to Glenn today, our guest, to discuss tinnitus for two reasons, really. Recently, our 10-year-old daughter has begun to experience tinnitus regularly, and I noticeably had a reduction in my once non-stop tinnitus. This is a question I'm asked about often. How do you live with your tinnitus? So after rereading his book, Rewiring Tinnitus, I emailed him and asked him to share his story with you and more about his coaching program. So now a little bit about Glenn. Glenn Schweitzer is an entrepreneur, health coach, blogger, and the author of two best-selling books, Mind Over Meniere's, How I Conquered Meniere's Disease and Learned to Thrive, and Rewiring Tinnitus, How I Finally Found Relief from the Ringing in My Ears. He is passionate about helping others who suffer from tinnitus and vestibular disorders and has worked with nearly 1,000 patients one-on-one from all over the world over the last eight years, helping sufferers to habituate to their tinnitus and find lasting relief from the ringing in their ears. Lynn is also a columnist for HealthyHearing.com and volunteers as an ambassador for Vestibular Disorders Association, VITA. He continues to raise awareness for tinnitus, Meniere's disease, and other vestibular disorders, spreading his message of hope to those in need. Please welcome Glenn. So welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much for being here. And, Thank you so uh, much for having me, Heather. It's great to be here with you today. We'll dive into that in a little bit, but I want to know more about you. Can you tell sure. us a little bit about your story? And Yeah, I'm happy to. So this uh, this whole thing began... Back in 2011, uh, so 13 13 years ago now, and you know it's funny. I was I was thinking about it this morning. I was just kind of reflecting back get, as I was preparing for our chat, and uh, you know I in the beginning like it the very first symptoms I was experiencing was like a lot of brain fog and and just sort of disequilibrium and dizziness and and, mm-hmm. and then ultimately like a little bit of earfulness. But I didn't really know what it was, and I was I was at this age where I was very much in denial for a long time. Like I would just keep getting dizzy and I kept running into these these different symptoms and it would it was scary and it would bother me. And yet like I did nothing about it. Like I was so mm-hmm. afraid, I think, to even go to the doctor to to let it become real. Um but the very my very first time ever experiencing any of these symptoms, I was we were on a trip, uh my now wife and I, Megan, um she was my girlfriend at the time. And we, we flew out to Los Angeles. And I, I in hindsight, I might have been experiencing a little bit of symptoms before this, but this was the first mm-hmm. time that the symptoms actually started interfering with my life. I remember we we, we landed in, in LA and we got a rental car. And that that first morning, we, we drove to uh, Venice, to the Venice Beach boardwalk. And we, were, we, we got coffee and, and pastries and we were walking around. And that was my first real run in where I started to experience like a lot of mental fatigue and brain fog. Obviously I didn't I didn't know this word at the time. I just was feeling really off and weird and I couldn't think straight. And it was hard to like to speak coherently. But you know, we were I was trying to enjoy myself and I, I remember we got in the car to drive to Santa Monica and all of a sudden like I, I drove maybe like two blocks and just every I just I couldn't do it anymore. I pulled over. I was super dizzy. I my I was completely riddled with anxiety like my stomach was doing weird things and not like I ended up not being able to drive again at all for the entire Mm. remainder of that trip and I I got through the trip we had a good time uh feeling that weird just sort of the just feeling off feeling dizzy the whole time and then 
coming back, I just, it, it was this four or five month period where I kept, I kept having what I now know were, were like minor and progressively more intense episodes. Like I, I kept thinking I was getting food poisoning. Like we would, I remember one incident where we went to a, uh, a steak, a steakhouse. We had a nice meal and, you know, we went out for like coffee and, and desserts afterwards. And I got, that was, that was probably my first episode, my first real run in with vertigo. It was not severe vertigo. Like I, I later had, um, with, with Meniere's, but like it was enough that the room was sort of spinning. I, I was, I got nauseous. I threw up all over the bathroom. I was feeling this like deep feeling of shame. I, we were newly dating at the time and I had to like no. call Megan into the bathroom. And I just felt like I, like I could, I couldn't, I needed her, but like I, at the same time, it's, it's always so hard to ask for help. And I, you know, I didn't want her to see me like that. Um, and it just sort of, I, I, it's funny cause like in hindsight, it was just an incredibly sodium heavy meal that caused this for me. Like I, I know that now. But I thought it was food poisoning, and I told all my family and friends never to eat at that restaurant. Like, I, I didn't. Eat, I, I don't think I ever ate there again, even though oh, now no. I know. I know what happened, um, and it was just a lot of this sort of up and down progression. At the time, I was I had taken some time off school, but I, I was back in, in college, finishing up uh, my my final year at, at Florida Atlantic University in, in Boca Raton. I was getting a degree in IT and, and business management, and um, I would have episodes, what I now know were episodes in class, like where I'd be sitting in front of the computer in the computer lab and all of a sudden, you know, all I'd eaten was like chips or Chex Mix and I would just start getting dizzy and it would be, I wouldn't really, I'd be scared to drive home. Mm -hmm. And it just kept building and building and building. And I just was very much in denial for some reason. And I wasn't willing to see a doctor or do anything about it. I just kept thinking, well, I keep getting better at, you know, hopefully this will just resolve itself. Uh, but it all came to a head about four to five months in <clears throat> when I was, uh, I was in class in, in one of the computer labs. And, and I remember I, I wasn't very healthy at the time. Uh, I wasn't exercising a lot. I was, I was a bit overweight and we, I picked up like Wendy's or something on the way home. We were eating a lot of fast food, just, you know, typical college fare. Yeah. <laughs> and I picked up like some sort of cheeseburger and fries. And we were, I remember we were sitting on, on Megan's couch. She lived uh, just a couple blocks from the school. And I was watching like, we were watching like Seinfeld reruns or some, something, something like low key, just like, you know, mindless. And I stood up to throw the trash away and all, I just fell back to the couch and like I had been it wasn't a drop attack I don't think I've ever had a true drop attack but it was the most intense vertigo I, attack I had had but I mean I literally stood up and just collapsed backwards um thank god I was over a couch when that happened and not over like a staircase or, or or something sharp and it was a harrowing and traumatic experience for about an hour or so that that first one at that time it was the room was was spinning just classic rotational vertigo. Like I was extremely, I don't think I threw up that time, but I was extremely nauseous the entire time. I couldn't see straight and it would just destroyed my denial. Like clearly something was very wrong with me. Uh, right. and this was not just going away. And, uh, I remember just sort of sitting there like feeling so out of control and her just sort of like rubbing my back being like, don't worry, we'll go to the doctor. So the next morning I woke up and I, I was completely out of it. Like, like as, as most, I think it's common with the most, a lot of vestibular diagnoses. Like when you have significant episodes, it just robs you of all your mental and physical energy. So I just, I remember yeah. waking up in this thick fog, just feeling almost like the word, like a, like a hungover type feeling. And I, I looked up on my insurance, you know, my health insurance website of just the closest ENT office to where I, where I, where my, where Megan's apartment was. And I drove myself over there. I got an appointment that day and I drove myself over there um, thinking like, okay, you know, this fine, you know, this, the doctor will tell me what's wrong. I'll get a handle on this. Everything's, everything's going to be fine. Um, and that's not really at all what happened. Uh, <laughs> I had a horrific experience uh, with mm -hmm. my first ENT. Um, at least like in hindsight, like it could have been worse in the sense that like, at least he, he, he knew of many, like he, that was the first appointment where I heard Meniere's disease was this very first appointment. Right. And so I, I sort of went in there and I, I had I recounted to this, this elderly gentleman doctor who was sort of devoid of all emotion. Uh, and I, I started with what had just happened the night before. Cause that was just 
so scary to me. And and then mm -hmm. I sort of went backwards in time and started talking about all these symptoms I was having, how my, you know, the, the, I was having a lot of tinnitus. I had always had some degree of tinnitus, but Meniere's mm -hmm. disease turned it up permanently to a much, much louder volume than mm -hmm. I had ever experienced before. Like when I was young, I didn't even know that it wasn't normal to hear a sound in silence. I thought everyone could hear a sound in silence mm -hmm. when I was like very young. Um, and didn't really learn until I was in my teens that that wasn't normal. Um, but I, so I was telling him all, you know, I've been having dis dizziness and my ears constantly feel like I have a cold, like it's filled with like pressure and fluid. And I think I'm at my hearing's affected. I'm having all this dizzy and this thing last night. And he listened and he's like, all right, well, you have Meniere's disease. Like didn't, it, that was like opening line. Like, okay, well you have, what you have is called Meniere's disease. It just, it explains perfectly all the symptoms you've experiencing this, this attack you had last night. Um, every time you have one of the, there's, there's no cure. You're going to live, you're going to have to live with this for the rest of your life. Uh, every time you have one of those attacks, it's going to damage your hearing a little bit. Like, you know, each attack might not be significant in the hearing damage, but this is going to progress. And eventually like it'll lead to a total hearing loss. And, and I had it in both ears. Like it was worse in my left ear, but, but it was in, it was in both ears. So immediately I'm, I'm just here. It's, my mind is, is starting to, to spiral and he's going, right. you know, Oh, you're going to need to cut alcohol and caffeine and avoid chocolate and reduce sugar and sodium. And I'm just like, I'm hearing all this thinking like, I was just coming here to like figure out what's wrong with me and get some medicine. <laughs> like, what are you saying to me? And when I'm, I've always been the type of person where like, I want to understand things. Like, so right. if, if, if I'm given, if I'm told like, hey, you have an uncurable rare disease that's going to affect you for the rest of your life, like, mm -hmm. and you're telling me that, like, I want to understand what you're what you're saying to me. And I, I started right. asking a lot of questions and a lot of doctors don't like this. Mm -hmm. um, and he he did not like this at all. And I remember he started yelling at me. I remember he, he yelled, he, he was saying something like, what, you don't believe me? Are you the expert now? Are you the doctor? You have Meniere's disease. You have to do these things I'm telling you, or you're not going to get, you know, nothing is going to change. And I just he wouldn't answer my questions. He didn't under, he didn't see the just scared, like per, broken person in front of him. Like mm -hmm. he just, and I, he just didn't get it. And I left that day completely hopeless. Like it was, it was like the worst possible first experience for me that I, I just can't imagine how it could have gone any worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it'd be worse to get no diagnosis, but maybe not right. on, on some level. Cause like, I, yeah. I just, it, I just spiraled into this deep depression. I mean, I, and so of course, you know, I went online and everything online, I'm just filling my head with like the worst possible reports of suffering and cases. I remember reading a, uh, some sort of study that came out a long time ago that did like a meta analysis of, it was like a quality of life study of people with late stage Meniere's and they were talking about how like the, the, the quality of life scores were lower than people like weeks from death with terminal cancer. And I'm, and I'm reading all this and I'm seeing all this suffering and hopelessness. And I, it just, the worst possible scenario just became concrete in my mind. And I sort of just gave up now. He, so, so at the time, my, my family wasn't giving up. Like I, they saw me like spiraling completely. I mean, I've, I've struggled with anxiety off and on my whole life. And this was just, it was reaching new heights. You know, I just, it was, I was, it was tough. It was a really, really, really dark time in my life. Um, but my family was was like, all right, well, before you rush to judgment here, we should at least try to get a second opinion. Like maybe there's something you can do in the meantime. And so when, when I saw that first doctor, he did, he, he prescribed me the basic like first line treatments for many years. He gave me a, a, a prescription for diazide, for, for diuretics and for mm -hmm. prednisone, like a course of prednisone. And I, that first week I was just, it's funny, like I was, I was in despair, but I also was like, he's got to be wrong. Like there was a part of me that was like, maybe he's wrong. Maybe this is just going to mm -hmm. go away. Like still like a little bit defiant and in denial right. to the last moment. And so I didn't do anything for that first week. I continued to drink coffee. I continued to eat like I was eating. And every day I was, I was feeling worse. And at the end mm -hmm. of that week, I was just like, okay, like he's not wrong. This is a, this is a major problem. And, and so my family convinced me to get a, a second opinion yeah. uh, and, and even like did the research to find a good doctor, like a, a neurotologist for me. And for those who are listening, a neurotologist is an ENT doctor that has subspecialized in treating uh, neurologic, neurological disorders of the inner ear and or hearing and balance disorders. And they tend to have a lot more experience treating and diagnosing Meniere's and other vestibular disorders. 
And uh, I didn't know any of this at the time. I just knew they found me a specialist at the University of uh, Miami. I made the appointment. It was like a, maybe like two weeks out. And I decided that like, at least in the meantime, like I was going to, maybe I could fight a little bit. Like maybe I can try some of this stuff. The doctor was telling me. So I started the meds. I cut my sodium down. I stopped drinking coffee begrudgingly. <laughs> um, I, I really, I started exercising. Like I was like, all right, I recognized that I wasn't very healthy in a lot of aspects of my life, that at least there was, there were things I could focus on and work on to like give myself a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. But I was still, I still didn't believe that I, that there was a possibility of a life that was worth living. Like I was, maybe I can reduce my suffering, but I thought I just had this image in my mind that I was going to be disabled uh, mm -hmm. for the rest of my life and, and slowly go deaf. And, uh, but, but it was all these changes and the meds like were help on the one hand, it was helping like the dizziness and the consistent like e disequilibrium was, was reducing a bit. So like right. it was an actual noticeable change and that was kind of gave me a little glimmer of hope and was, was promising. Um, but the problem was this, I, I'm even to this day, like I'm so sensitive to steroids. Like I, they make me feel so crazy. And so like, I, and I just don't sleep. I can barely sleep when I'm on them. So like I basically, it was impossible to fall asleep. And then once I did fall asleep, like I was waking up like five times a night to go to the bathroom because of the, the diuretics. Right. And so just my sleep was falling apart and now my anxiety and depression is getting worse. Um, so I eventually backed off the medications, but like, it was enough that like, okay, something, something worked, like something was giving me a little bit of, of, of a reprieve here. And, um, so, so finally I, I get to this second appointment. That first doctor did no testing. They, they did a hearing test. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, they did a hearing test and I, I had low and mid frequency hearing loss, uh, to some degree, not, not major, but, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, consistent with a Meniere's diagnosis and, so I, I show up at this appointment at the University of Miami and I ended up seeing a, a, a truly wonderful doctor there. And he was just the the literal opposite of that first doctor in every every way that matters. Like it was, um, he was kind and compassionate. He was patient with me. Like he was willing to answer as many questions as I had for him. He told me, you know, he's like, listen, you know, going over your history, like it, it does sound like this diagnosis is correct, Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can do, we'll do some more testing to make sure, you know, to rule out some other possibilities here. And he, he, he spent some time telling me about some of his patients who were doing really well, which was like, I think all doctors should do that. That's like, right. what a, what a, what a blessing that was, you know, like, so he's just, awesome. he, 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 he told, he told me a lot of the change. He was, he was like, the changes you're making, these are good changes. Like keep mm -hmm. up that good work. And here's some other things you can try. Here's some supplements you can try. He told me about some of the treatment possibility, like if, you know, if the lifestyle management and, and sort of the lower level adjustments and treatments weren't helping, he kind of gave me a sense that there was like a lot more things we could try and do if necessary. And he told me that if, if I was able to get a handle on the attacks, there was no reason to just expect to go deaf. Uh, that, that like, if, if I could manage the symptoms to the level where I'm not having attacks, there was no reason to think that my hearing was just going to continually degrade or if it did like i, I would have it was i wasn't just gonna go completely deaf like i was deep this became like this deep fear inside of me even to this day like when i get sick and i get a lot of i have a lot of chronic sinus stuff uh when my ears when i have congestion in my sinuses and my ears are clogged like i mm -hmm. it brings up all that old residual like fear that i felt right. in those in those early days but I, the way i like to, to talk about to say is like he, he painted a picture of a world where I could be okay. And mm -hmm. I didn't even know that world existed until he, he showed it to me. Right. And it was, it was, it was a major turning point in, in my life. And it was like a light bulb went off and it's like, it, I, in my book, I, I, I just, I said like, he, it was like, he gave me my power back. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, I had this feeling like I can fight for this, like for my health, like I, I can find my way through this. And, mm -hmm. And I, and it just it like not, none of that existed before I met that. It's it's crazy mm -hmm. to think how what my what, what direction my life might have gone had I never found this person so early on. And I didn't even end up see. I, I had a few follow ups with him, and that that was really it. I, I ended up I ended up sort of through a lot of trial and error, just sort of putting the pieces of my life back together. I found, you know, I I got really disciplined. I I I. I with, with everything. Like I, I cut my sodium down to about 1500 milligrams at most a day. I was 
so disciplined with with my diet. I I, I really rely. I leaned into routines. I would go to bed and wake up at the same time. I would meditate at the same. I, I I had been meditating for years. I'd meditated at the same time. I would exercise every day. That was a new thing, and I was doing that at the same time. I tried to create a structure in my life that would allow me to just sort of go through the days, like kind of maximizing my ability to reduce stress and improve my health. And it was working slowly. Like I was, I was having, you know, better, the symptoms, I know everybody's a little different. On my journey, there's always been this sort of mountain-like progression of, of symptoms. Like for me, it usually, the first warning sign is when I start to have an increase in brain fog and, and fatigue. And, and then generally like that might, progress into dizziness or earfulness one of the two mm -hmm. comes next tinnitus increase i uh, know dizziness tinnitus increase earfulness and and more dizziness and and if left unchecked i and, and i it kept going I, I imagine i would end up back in, in, in having a full episode although i have not right. had thank god and knock on wood a full episode in, in quite a long time um and and so it took a long time to like go up the mountain, this like, long progression of increasing symptoms. And then coming down the mountain took like an equally long amount of time. Like it wasn't a, a quick fix. It was months and months of trial and error and experimenting and, and a slow reduction of my symptoms and, and a learning to, to, to do the thing, how to do the things I wanted to do, like learning to contend with the, you know, even, even though I was able to reduce symptoms, I still was living with a lot of sudden unwanted limitations and it was a lot of coming to terms with that um mm -hmm. and, and finding my way through and i stopped all the internet research i got off at the yes. time all the message boards and the forums and, and groups and i just because i it was clear at that point like there is hope and this is just taking me in the opposite direction right um there was so few people talking about meniere's in a hopeful way and i think mm -hmm. that's the problem with all health chronic conditions and just health problems across the board. Like every time I work with people all the time uh, in, in, my, in my coaching work, um, I'll tell people like, stop researching for a little while, just for just for like, you know, because within the program, like I'll, I'll give them a plan to follow and you know, they have me to, for support. And, and I'll say just for a little while, like back, like unsubscribe from the, the message boards, the groups, because like, and then I'll say to them, like, think of all the other health problems and, you know, illnesses you've had in your life. How many times have you gone online and written up a story of like what it took to get better. Like nobody, most people don't do that. The vast majority yeah. of people don't do that. So the people online are the ones that are trying to figure it out, who are suffering mm -hmm. actively, right? And right. It, become, it can become a bit of an echo chamber of, of, of people who are having a really hard time. So I backed away from all that. And I, I slowly put the pieces of my life back together. And now interestingly, like I had already started to sort of go off into this more entrepreneurial direction like i knew i didn't want to work for anyone else that i wanted to work for myself mm -hmm. and i i had sort of started this like supplement uh, wholesaling company that had started to take off not a big business but like it was like enough to support me as a full-time income and i could set my own hours and work at home and, and so it was like the perfect this this had already started to come together in the middle of all this so like there was this feeling like i wasn't going to be able to do it at first but once I once I started to get a handle on things, like it was like a, I just it was it was just luck really, like that mm -hmm. I had this business now that was that was generating income, and I was still very young. I didn't have a family yet, like I didn't need a lot to survive at this point, right? Um, and so I know it, it would have looked very different when you're hit later in life. I know even your story, like when you're hit later in life and it suddenly upends everything, like that's. I fully recognize that I I was I was for in, in some ways fortunate to have this happen so young, before I had a lot to lose, um, and I could sort of build from the ground up around around my 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 health condition. Um, mm -hmm. But so I had this job where I was working at home. I set my own hours. If I was really dizzy, like I was just or having symptoms, like I would wouldn't work for a while, and I'd work later. Like so, I it was that was very conducive to like allowing me to stick with all these routines and, 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 you know, I was, it's, it's hard to live. I often say like you, we make our world very small when, when we're dealing with a problem like this, because when the world is small, we can control the variables. We feel safer. We can manage our symptoms better, but it's hard to like live in this small world for a long time. But I, but I did, like, I was very 
rigid and, and disciplined for a long time. And so like it took a, lo a much longer amount of time before I learned to, to do the things I wanted to do again, to like open my life up more broadly. Um, but, but really from that point forward, I've never been in remission, though I've, I have not had a significant battle with like vertigo and, and symptoms ever since. It's funny, like right now I'm in p perhaps what I would consider to be like the, the best period of time that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are moments where I, cause like I, I, I have very few limitations by comparison now for some reason, sodium is not a big trigger for me currently. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't need to be careful with my sodium anymore. Um, but then I'll run into situate like, and I'll think to myself, huh, like maybe I'm in remission. Like, cause I like, this is, it's pretty incredible. Like how, how far I can push myself and, and not, and then I'll end up in situations like this past November, I was at my, my uh, youngest brother's wedding. We have a, a, a 14 month old baby now. She was like less than a year old at the time. And, and I have a five year old and, and, you know, we're in this one, this little hotel room together in Jersey city. And the baby just decided to stop sleeping. Uh, and so there was like this, and I'm, I was one of the, me and my other brother were the, the co-best men. So like we had to be involved and we were a part of it. I had to give a speech, you know, I was like, I was like actively involved in the weekend and right. I, I just was waking up all night, hours and hours awake every single night. It was like this slow descent into madness and compiled with the fact that like, you know, they're at the rehearsal dinners at this pizza restaurant and like they're bringing pizza after pizza after pizza, oh, pasta, goodness. like cheese, like, yeah. So I'm just eating garbage. And, and I remember I was starting to feel, it, it felt like sleep deprivation at first until we were standing on the pier. We were getting on the ferry at, in Jersey City to, to shoot across to Manhattan to go to New York City for, for a few hours. And I, I, I walked on to the, to the pier, to like the dock. And the minute I felt that, the, I just like, <laughs> I had to like sit down and the, re yeah. the rest of the trip, I was quite dizzy. So definitely not in remission, um, but I've lived a great life ever since. Um, and so that's sort of, that was sort of, that's a good summary of like kind of the journey I was on um, with all of this per perspective. Yeah, it sounds like you've, you have figured out the perfect combination on how to continue living despite these symptoms. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, that's good. It's, it's hard to get there though. I mean, there is a yeah. lot of trial and error. Um, as I was reading your book, I, I, I had, tinnitus for the first six or seven months nonstop. And I've only mm -hmm. experienced it in my life um, just once in a while and nothing that's, that was alarming to me where I ran off to, to, to sure. figure out what was going on. So I just kind of experienced it and moved on. Um, but when, my, when the symptoms began in 2016 for me, a friend of mine, after it hadn't gone away for six or seven months, she um, recommended masking aids. And that was the first six. I'm like, okay, I have no idea, but I know that it's it's driving me crazy. So I will try anything. Yeah. Sure. And I wasn't even wearing hearing aids at that time. And so I I wore them for a while. So and you got you you purchased hearing aids for the purpose of masking. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yes. Just just for the I I needed hearing aids, but she um, it's a long story because she was just getting her licensure, so she had sure. um what do they call them. Um, if this isn't the right word, but it's like testing aids just to see if you sure. like them. Yeah, and most places have... will let you test, will trial a mm -hmm. pair. And if they don't, like yeah. there's there's legal, like legally they have to allow for a full refund within, it's like three or six month period. Right. Like that's a legal mandate for all hearing aids. But most places will let you trial uh, whatever pair you're interested in for like a period yeah, of time. And I, I just felt, even though I just started wearing them, it was, I just remember a calmness come over me after I got acclimated to the noise, yeah. um, it was just a soothing noise to me. And then I returned them, but I continued with my, my daily practices, like you mentioned, um, every morning with the journaling and meditating. And sure. the distraction, as I was reading in your book, and I want to ask you more about that, um, I did not realize until I read your book that when I journal, I journal with all five senses. I make sure that when I'm journaling, I'm aware of, because I'm usually... Um, journaling about what's going on in the moment, like how I'm feeling, what I'm feeling, what I'm saying. So you're not talking I'm... about a symptom tracking journaling, no. more just journaling in the traditional sense of journaling. Yes. It's just, um, it's mm -hmm. actually, I'm having a brain fart right now. <laughs> That's it's, okay. um, 
it's three pages of longhand and it's just whatever sure. comes to your mind. I, there is a name for That's it. It's a great and, practice. Yes. And I make sure that all five senses are there. But after that practice, I was also doing that with the masking. One day I just um, realized, wait a minute, where is my tinnitus? It's, it's gone. I just didn't notice it. And now today it is one of my warning signs, whatever I'm doing. Yes. Stress, I need to bring it down. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a good place to be. So can you tell us more about the distracting or however you want to get there? I just know that that's a in terms of like coping with tinnitus specifically? Yeah, yes. Sure, yeah. So the t for me, so, so like I said, my, my, I've always had some degree of tinnitus. It was very minor, but I've also, I recognize now, and this is something that sort of dawned on me only recently, strangely, is that I've always had very sensitive ears. Not, so, mm -hmm. not in the sense of like, I was sensitive, I was having sound sensitivity, but that if I was in a, I was sensitive to loud noise. So like if I would mm -hmm. go to a party, or a concert, and I never wore earplugs back then. Right. Um, you know, whereas m some of my friends maybe had a little bit of tinnitus, like mm -hmm. without fail, I had raging tinnitus, like stuffiness, temporary hearing loss, like it was like o over overwhelming. Um, but anyways, but when Meniere's happened, my tinnitus was as loud as it's it's ever been, um, and and to, even to this day, like it's remained at an elevated level. Uh, like my 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 normal tinnitus is a like a medium to high pitched tone, sort of in the like what people think of when they think ringing in the ears, um, and it's fairly loud. I can hear it in most environments, but I don't hear it in most environments. Like being able to hear it and and actually hearing it are are two very simple things. So I think I think I want to come at this from a specific angle. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so. I, I'll kind of use distraction as a way to make the case for, for habituation. So yeah. it when I'll start by saying like, not everybody suffers from their tinnitus. Mm -hmm. it's even, and with Meniere's, there's a lot of, often a lot of um, fluctuation and variation. And so like during episodes, people may have intense tinnitus that bothers them. But I found that a lot of patients aren't experiencing like problematic, bothersome tinnitus all the time. Um, I, I was, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and some people, some people do, but, but just because there is a sound present in your ears or your head that isn't there, like doesn't necessarily mean you're going to suffer. 60% of people who experience chronic tinnitus have no problem with it, never mm -hmm. develop any sort of, uh, an issue. Whereas 40% of people start to develop this negative impact on their quality of life, where it's, it starts to the brain and the nervous system start to react to the sound as if it's the sound of something dangerous. And so it mm -hmm. triggers this fight or flight stress response that never fully ends because the tinnitus doesn't go away. And then it initiates this sort of vicious cycle where this deepening emotional and psychological impact that starts to happen where people start to like, they really don't like it. It starts to intrude into their, into their awareness, it starts to cause anxiety and emotional dysregulation and impact their sleep and focus. And it becomes this this vicious cycle. This it all snowballs into that reaction until all of a sudden it it becomes this much bigger problem where it can hijack your nervous system into a near continuous state of anxiety and agitation and activation, and it just ripples out and impacts every aspect of your quality of life more and more intensely. Um, and and I, there's a parallel to be made here with Meniere's more broadly too. Like I think Meniere's is very traumatic, and and, mm -hmm. and like I to me the condition that acute and severe tinnitus most closely resembles is actually not any other hearing or physical health problem. But to me, tinnitus looks like PTSD, like more than any other problem. The way it hijacks the nervous system, the way you're in constant like threat detection, the way it just causes all such intense anxiety and depression, the way that, you know, you can have a period like a week where you're like pretty doing pretty well and it's low. And then all of a sudden you have a spike and it feels like you're starting all over again. It, this, all the suffering uh, rushes back in as if it never left. Mm -hmm. uh, all this is a very is like a heavy, like, like trauma-like, traumatic-like component there, like a PTSD-like response. And I think Meniere's also has this similar, like, emotional challenge and psychological mm -hmm. challenge. Um, but with tinnitus, the good news is that, like, you can, through this process called habituation that we, we talked about very briefly in the beginning, you can find, like, lasting complete and lasting relief from from your tinnitus even if it never goes away and it's hard for people to understand like how that could possibly be true right you're hearing this sound and it's driving you crazy and it's intruding over everything and you can't focus on the tv you can't think straight it's just 
dominating everything. And you think that's, that's not possible. Like, I hate this. How, how could I possibly be happy if this doesn't just go away? Mm -hmm. Right. But, but it is possible. And, and, and so back to distraction, like what I always tell people is like, think, because everybody gets distracted from their tinnitus periodically. Like you get engaged with, you know, with, uh, with something you're doing, you're working on something, you're talking to somebody, you're watching a movie, right? And people that are really suffering will always push back on this and say, oh, I never get distracted. But they, they do. It's, it's, it might be for brief moments, but, but everybody does. The problem is we're only thinking about it when it's bothering us. So this makes it feel like it's always there, even, even though right. that we are getting distracted. But, but everyone can usually connect with this idea is that like, think back to a time where the tinnitus was there, but you got lost in your work and you forgot about it for like 20 minutes. In that 20 minute period, it was like, it was like it didn't exist. You weren't mm -hmm. thinking about it. You weren't hearing it. You weren't noticing it, right? It, you're, 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 it's not intruding in. You're, you're living a quality of life in that 20 minutes, identical to a person who never had tinnitus, right? Now it's fleeting. The minute when that 20 minutes is over, it's you know right in front of your face again and your awareness and driving you crazy. But the fact that you can become it like distracted from it at all, it's all the proof anyone needs that their brain is capable of delivering them this type of experience, even on mm -hmm. a bad day. There are obstacles preventing this from happening all the time when you're dealing with bothersome tinnitus. So, like uh, workable obstacles, like solvable challenges that are in the way that are preventing you from being distracted. But if, but what I always tell people is, is if how you notice your tinnitus when you're fully distracted, or how, how your tinnitus feels when you're fully distracted was how you experienced your tinnitus all the time, it wouldn't matter that it never went away because it yeah. would feel as though it had. So I don't like I, I have fully habituated to my tinnitus, and if you'd like, we can we can talk more about how I was able to do that. And when you say habituated, does that mean yeah. that it is like if you focus on it right now, it's still there, but it just doesn't? Yes. It's not bothersome. Correct. It's not. Okay. It, there's no. I have completely changed the underlying relationship in my nervous system. So just noticing my normal low baseline tinnitus, I feel mm -hmm. nothing. It's it's like if okay. I notice it when watching a movie, it, it's similar to like noticing the sound of my air conditioning turn on when I'm watching a movie, like I'll notice right. it. And then I go right back to the movie because like, right. nothing happened. Right. That's now so interesting. I, I'm at the point now where I can talk about other people's tinnitus all mm -hmm. in my, in my one-on-one -on -one tinnitus coaching work all day and not hear my own tinnitus or think about my own tinnitus. That wasn't true. When I, when I first started writing mind over Meniere's and then ultimately mm -hmm. the, the, my tinnitus book rewiring tinnitus, I was thinking about, I went from like, barely thinking about my symptoms to thinking about them all the time for not, not in a bothersome way, but just this constant awareness. But even that's, even that's gone now. I'm at the point now where if I have a spike, there's a chance I, I might not need to do anything. Like I might just be fine if I expect it to be loud, if I'm sick, if I'm going through an intense period of stress and I would expect to feel this way. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I do start to have some sort of anxiety response or, or emotional response, I'm at the point now where most of the time it's like a minute of, of, of specific coping techniques where I can calm my nervous system back down and get back to my day without incident, maybe a little bit of meditation and then I'm back to my day. So right. that's, that's how far you can take it. I I'm, I'm every bit as happy as I've ever been. Tinnitus impacts my quality of life. 0%, right? Like occasionally mm -hmm. for a few minutes, I may need to deal with it. But when I compare how much time I spend dealing with all of the other responsibilities and stressful things in my life. Like, you know, and I think about how many, you know, how much time I spend dealing with tinnitus by comparison, the tinnitus is, it's like a non-existent problem in my life. Right. So that's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. awesome. My, um, like I told you, mine has gone away and it's just a warning sign when it does return. Sure. My husband in his former rock years <laughs> was a concert goer and, yep. um, he has it constantly, but he doesn't yeah. notice it unless I bring it up, you know, and he's like, ah, I can't get it out of my head now. But, um, but it's constantly. And the interesting thing is my daughter just turned 10 last year and she has bouts of it, but it, she'll say, oh gosh, mom, that thing's ringing in my ears and she'll just stop what she's doing. And then, then when it goes away, she'll continue on. But I, at first I didn't is know. It, how would... long does it last for in your daughter? Is it like um, 30 seconds or a minute? Yes. Is it quick? Most like so that that's most likely what's known as a transient noise episode, and it's 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 usually just a muscle spasm of the middle ear where like okay. I get those too, and they're they're scary because 
when m many people who've never experienced any sort of chronic tinnitus or have any ear problems get these. Mm -hmm. I've talked to countless people who, who, who can relate oh, to this. Good. For me, it, it for like a minute, 30 seconds to a minute, I feel this like, like it feels like all my hearing gets sucked out of my ear and this mm -hmm. pressure is left and like a tinnitus that's like 20 times louder than my normal. I mean, it's like deafening and, and it's yeah. they, like, they're scary, but now I, now I, I know what it is. I've had a million of them. And now I, I always treat that as an opportunity of like, how much can I calm myself before this ends? And I try to use it as like a little test. Um, but yeah, unrelated to the yeah. chronic tinnitus that, that most people Good. are dealing with, but so, so, and, and very common, common experience, even for people who, who don't have any sort of chronic tinnitus or, or tinnitus history okay. in your, in your husband's case, I would say that he habituated naturally to some extent. Like mm -hmm. I would, I, most people given a long enough period of time of constant tinnitus mm -hmm. or even fluctuating tinnitus, like most people will habituate naturally to some extent. This is a natural process. Like habituation is the name of the mental process by which we can become distracted from sensory perceptions. So like right now, while we're talking, you're not paying attention to the feel, the sensations of sitting, the light around, you know, coming from overhead, the feeling of your clothing. Like there's many things you're not paying attention to and we're not choosing to ignore any of it. We're just choosing right. to chat with each other and everything else is just kind of filtered out of our awareness. And so we're able to do this with sound also. Uh, mm. and, and in the case of tinnitus, there are specific obstacles, like I said, preventing that from happening. Um, primarily the, the main one of which is just like when you're, if you're, if your brain thinks that a sound is the source of something dangerous, like from a survival standpoint, like you wouldn't want it, like you would never want to not be able to hear the sound of a fire alarm going off. Like you wouldn't want to be able to sleep through that. Right. No. Um, and so there's very specific things that are preventing that from happening, but given enough time, most people will habituate to some degree naturally. And it sounds like your, your husband has, or, or maybe mm -hmm. it, it never even fully rose to the level of becoming a problem in his life. Um, yeah. Now I would argue that like with, by working on it, he can get to a much greater level of relief. Um, but it no is desire. true to say that most people, <laughs> yeah. And I, and nor, do, nor does he have a need if it's not really getting right. in the way. So, yeah. um, but it, it is true. That's, it's, it's something to be hopeful about that. Even if you do nothing, like most right. people eventually, even if it takes a long time, can yeah. get to a point where they're coping better. Cool. I know another thing in uh, one of your books was uh, preventative coping. I love yes. that. Because I think with even without realizing a lot of us do that with our Meniere symptoms. Um, yeah. And could, could you take us through that concept? Because it was sure. something new to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, the idea is that it can be very difficult to find your symptom triggers or your tinnitus triggers. Um, this, you know, to, to look at your diet and lifestyle and environment and like point to specific factors and say, you know, mm -hmm. that thing makes my tinnitus or my symptoms worse every time. Sometimes it's obvious, like early in my Meniere's journey, like I, in some ways it was lucky that it was, it was so glaringly obvious. Like I would drink coffee and like 20 minutes later, I would <laughs> feel all my symptoms increasing. I would eat a sodium heavy meal. All my, <laughs> all my, you know, 20 minutes later, the brain fog said it was like immediate, like it's yeah. not immediate for everyone. So, so it's, it can be very difficult to find triggers of your symptoms, though, especially with Meniere's, I think it's, it's important to do that work, to try to identify your, your triggers. Less so with tinnitus, but with Meniere's certainly. And, but but what it's not, what's not as difficult to find in either case is what I call like broader patterns of vulnerability. So this would be like times of day, certain types of situations, or certain types of environments where you know you're more vulnerable to having some sort of difficulty with your symptoms, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when I wake up in the morning, like at this time of day, when I get home from this, in this room in my house, in this environment, right? In this type of situation. And when these patterns emerge, the result is often anticipatory anxiety. And of course it is. Like in the case of tinnitus, let's say, you know, you're, you're at work, it's bit, there's a lot of stuff going on, you're distracted, you're not thinking about tinnitus too much. And you get home at five to a quiet house. Like, well, of course, that's going to be a time where you're going to tend to notice it more and think about it more, right? And so if that's happening every day, then at 4.30, you're going to start, you're getting ready to leave work and you're going to think, God, it's been, you know, like, I hope that, hope that five o'clock thing doesn't happen today. And you could be having a great day. And all it takes is that one, one anxiety thought that, and it can become sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy where the mm -hmm. anticipatory anxiety becomes like kind of, it sets off a chain reaction and becomes the anxiety at that five o'clock pattern, right? Um, and so the strategy is if you can identify some of these patterns in your day, you can come up with a preventative coping routine, 
you know, comprised of the same sort of coping tools and, and techniques that you would normally use when you're already feeling bad to try to feel better, like relaxation techniques, breathing techniques, masking, meditation, things like that, things you would normally use as like a way to recover from a difficult, from a difficult experience, but you can use them ahead of time before mm -hmm. you actually need them to boost your emotional and psychological defenses as high as possible to hopefully avoid having that difficult moment or at the very least to mitigate some of its impact. And, you know, on, on if you can avoid a single difficult experience once, it's a good enough mm -hmm. reason to think through this and try to like figure out some of these patterns in your life. But on a deeper level, sometimes it's just anticipatory anxiety that perpetuates these cycles. And then yeah. to stick with the example I was giving with tinnitus, like if you can make it two weeks of coming home at five where you have a seamless transition from, from work to home and you're not thinking about tinnitus and being bothered mm -hmm. by it, then you're going to stop anticipating that difficult moment, moment. And sometimes it just goes away. And so, uh, but, and you can also use this as like a one-off too, where if you have something difficult coming up that you're worried about, like you can ask yourself, like, what can I do ahead of time to boost my defenses and minimize the chance of something going wrong? And, and there's, there's, there's more planning that can be done. There's other interesting strategies that you can use to plan for specific activities and events. But I think this is a really helpful one because it's, it's just changing the timing of your tools. Like instead of like having to put the fire out, you're, you're preventing the fire in the first place, which can lead to a much more stable experience throughout the day. And this sort of thinking can be applied towards many years or tinnitus in, in all sorts of different ways. So um, right. Yeah, that's something that kind of I came up with uh, a couple of years ago and has, and has been a helpful, a helpful strategy. Uh, that I, I love it. My, I love it because it, it not only works towards with tinnitus, but other things. So many people reach out to me yep. and they don't know how they're going to go on the vacation to the beach or mm. take the plane ride or the car <clears> ride. And it's or do this or do that, you know. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so here, here's another then here's another sort of helpful strategy that sort of builds okay. from there. So um, there's an author named Tim Ferriss, who who, who I like, uh, he, he's a um, an entre writes about entrepreneurship things, business things. Um, he has this famous book called The Four Hour Work Week. He has an incredibly successful podcast. He's a, he's a really inspiring guy. And in, in his book, The Four Hour Work Week, he had this exercise that he called fear setting. Um, mm. And I sort of adapted his i, I kind of took that and customized it to make it make more sense for mm -hmm. chronic illness um and uh I, I i can send you if you want a, a an article that and a video that we can maybe put in the show notes if people want to check this out because i actually yeah. made a worksheet a worksheet for meniere's patients uh around this but the basic idea i'll kind of i'll kind of just give people a a walkthrough uh, of this technique because I think it's it's helpful in a similar way uh, to to the preventative coping strategy and preventative coping ties into this. So the basic idea is like you know when when you're living with Meniere's, like you, your fear fear becomes a big part of your day, like it infiltrates every aspect of your day, and it's not a rational fear either. Like when your symptoms can just flare up at any moment, right. of course that affects the decisions you make. Right? We end up staying home. We make our world small. We say yeah. no to plans, you know, we avoid, we avoid going places we used to enjoy and doing the things we used to enjoy doing. Um, but part of my philosophy with chronic illness has always been to always try to fully understand like where the current true nature and extent of my limitations currently lie. Like what, what are my current limitations? Um, because right. if you know what you're, if you know what you're actually up against, you can start to predict how your choices affect you. And you can make decisions where fear doesn't have to be the deciding factor, whether you do something or not. So here's a simple strategy for anyone who, who's like wants to do something or they're invited to do something and they're just really worried, like, how could I possibly do this? Uh, try this instead. Like, and, and again, there's a worksheet for this that I made uh, and, and, I, and I think we'll be able to put that in the show notes. So first, ask yourself, if, it's, it's a six question thing that you want to kind of grab a pencil and write down your answers as you do this. So first... You ask, will I enjoy myself if I go do this? And it's it's a simple question, but it's an important one to ask because occasionally taking a risk and pushing yourself for somebody else's benefit might not be a good enough reason to participate. But assuming, yes, like I'd love to do this, like, okay, then you move on to question two. What could go wrong? Write down a list of everything you can think of that might go wrong if you go do this activity and make sure to include like a worst case scenario. Um, oftentimes... When we're considering doing something like this, we're feeling a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. And, and it's helpful to give like specificity and clarity to exactly what it is 
you're afraid of. Like sometimes you'll write it all down and realize like, I'm not actually really that worried about any of these things if they went wrong. Like, why am I avoiding this? And and in my and the answer in myself has always been like, because it's like some sort of big thing. And every time I think about it, I, I guess I just feel anxious and I stop mm -hmm. thinking about it. <laughs> but but it's like when I actually think it through, it's like I'm not actually really that nervous. But anyways, uh, you write it all down. You write down everything that could go wrong. And then you ask yourself, how can I prepare? And this is where preventative coping comes in. Like, what can you do ahead of time to boost your defenses and minimize the risk of any of these problems from occurring? What steps can you take to prepare? An extension of that, question four, is what can you bring with you to address potential problems? So uh, I always say it's better to have, like, a heavy bag with lots of stuff that you don't end up needing than to need something and not have it, right? So things like, you know, medications, supplies, supplements, emergency equipment, like, whatever you might need that you could bring mm -hmm. with you to, you know, rescue medications and emergency, you know, emergency plans, um, if, if something, if a problem arises, right. And then yeah. number, so, so you, so you make, you make a that list and you bring all that stuff with you and then you make a plan and not just one plan, but a plan for every possible thing that could go wrong. Um, and, and when you're making a plan, you want to plan, not just how it's not just how will you get back to safety, but what would it take to recover mm -hmm. if this thing were to go wrong and this were to happen? Because a lot of times like we avoid things because they could go wrong, but without really thinking that piece of it through. So I'll tell you a quick kind of side story. So when I got married, we went on our, our honeymoon to uh, Spain and Italy. Mm. And uh, it was at a time where I, I was like active, heavily active in my symptom management. This was in when I was in that heavy routine. So this was like a a huge deal for me to like go do this trip. And so like, I was trying to figure out like, how can I manage all these things? And I, you know, I, I, I planned as best as I could. And, you know, I knew though that it was going to be, I was going to be pushing like way past the line. Like I, I remember I landed, we, we were in this hotel in Barcelona and I grabbed, they had this, this like this room with like free food and drinks. And I grabbed a bottle of mineral water and all of a sudden I start, I hadn't, I didn't sleep on the red eye. I was already in a compromised state and I look at the bottle. I start feeling dizzy. It had 1200 milligrams of sodium in that little <laughs> bottle of water. And so like, that was, that was the start to the trip. Uh, you know, you try to order food without sodium, but you know, stuff gets lost in translation, but I got through it and I had an amazing, amazing time. And then coming back from that trip, I was a complete wreck. And I knew I would be, I was going to be like, I knew the chance of this was high. And so I took like I budgeted like an extra five days or something with no work. Like, so mm -hmm. that if I, if I needed it to just, just recuperate, mm -hmm. I could. Right. And, right. and people hear me talk like this and they think it's like, Oh, you know, that sucks. You got to live your life in this careful way and plan. And, but I, I see it as like empowerment. It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'll never, if there's something that's really important to me, I won't let Minier take that from me. Like I'll find a way to do it. Right. Even, and if I have to pay the price and like, I'll make that part of the plan. Right. Yeah. There's limits, of course, but like, you know, uh, sure. I'm not going to put myself in danger. But anyways, so so what would it take? How do you get to safety? How would you recover? So it's the recovery is an interesting piece of it. And then ask yourself, thinking it all through, you ask yourself if it's worth it. Maybe mm -hmm. you think about it, you go into this level of detail. It's not worth it, right? But but it, then, then it's not a fear-based decision. That's like a highly informed decision about your health. Um, but if it is worth the risk, what I always say is just make the decision to participate and fully accept all of the possible consequences in advance. Like tell yourself all of this stuff could happen and I'm okay with it. And then just put it out of your mind and just go try to have the best possible time you can. If things do go wrong, you'll be prepared, as prepared as you can be. You'll have a plan right. in place to deal with problems. Uh, you won't be nearly as, and you won't be nearly as disappointed as you might've been because you already accepted the possibility of failure in advance. But in my opinion, even if it goes wrong, it's still a win because fear didn't hold you back from living your life on your own terms. And it might go right. better the next time, right? So, right. Uh, and then I, I, I took this whole thing and I created this this really, this cool tool, uh, printable um, worksheet where you, you can, you fill it all out and it has like a column to list problems and then the solutions to the problems and the recovery from those problems, steps to prepare, the toolkit you're gonna bring with you, an escape plan. And then if you follow the instructions, it all folds up into like a credit card sized folded piece of paper that has nice. emergency contacts on one side and emergency instructions on the other side. So people can Perfect. check that I out. I love that. Of course, I'm going to add that below. <laughs> and you know what? I love I love the first question because uh, we do so many things and put so much pressure on ourselves for 
um, doing things that we're not going to find joy, but just because we're invited. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. a, that's a good thing. Yeah. Sure. I mean, there's going to be time, you know, look, there's going to be times where you're obligated, right. And you right. have responsibilities to me. And in, in which case you skip that question, but no, it's, it's totally true. Like if there's, it might not be the best decision to push yourself past your limitations mm -hmm. for somebody else's benefit. If it's not even going to be something you would enjoy if you don't have right. to. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting part of the thinking. It really is. Yeah. I love it. Love it. Before we go on to whirlwind questions, is there anything else? I feel like we could talk on this topic for for hours. So we'll have to have you back and narrow it down. And um, sure. maybe some audience participation could tell us what they want to know more about. And um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to share with the community before we go on to the closing questions? About tinnitus or Meniere's or, or Whatever anything? Whatever you want to share. Actually, I would like um, if you take a minute to share about your coaching program. Sure. And, yeah. Um, so, well, well, first I'll say this, it, it, we're, if, if you have, if you're, if you're suffering from tinnitus or, or Meniere's, um, just first things first, like there's hope. Like that's, that's the one thing I wish somebody told me sooner. Like there is hope. Um, you know, it's, it's funny when I, when I first, I didn't like decide to help people with Meniere's. Like I decided I wanted to try to write a book. And I don't know why I thought I could write a book <laughs> or, or why I, or just a couple or books how, now. <laughs> how I came to that idea. But it was like, I was like, what, what could I write about? Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't, what do I know about? I don't know about anything. And then it hit me like, oh, you know, I'm, I've been living pretty well with that, that crazy ear thing. Like I bet people would want to know about, and then it just all grew uh, organically from there. But it, the, the takeaway with all of my work is that there's hope and, and, and like whatever you've tried so far, I promise you haven't tried everything and just don't, don't stop fighting for your health. Nobody will ever fight as hard as you can. And whatever you've tried, you never know. It just might be that next thing or that next combination of things that starts to move the needle. And I, and I recognize that I'm, I'm very lucky in the sense that like, I've been able to manage this without like very uh, intense medical interventions and, and, and ongoing treatments and that not everyone ha is able to do that. Right. Like I'm fully cognizant of that, that there's an element of, of luck in, in my own story that I was able to sort of hit the highs that, that I've been able to hit. Um, but, but there is hope and the coaching, you know, it's, it's funny. Like I, when I wrote, re the, the tinnitus work came together just because like I wrote I, this, I had discovered this meditation technique where I would focus on my tinnitus instead of the breath, because I would try to focus on the breath and the tinnitus would drive me crazy. And I just, I suddenly wasn't able to meditate anymore when Meniere started. And it was like, I had lost the most, one of the most valuable things in my life. And so I finally started focusing on the tinnitus instead and everything started to change. I didn't know why. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about tinnitus. I just knew I discovered this one thing that, that worked and made everything better. And it was like one or two pages in Mind Over Meniere's. And, and when, when I, got, I started getting email from people all over the world about that, that, that technique, and I said, okay, the universe is, is giving me a sign. Tinnitus is, you know, Meniere's is a tiny slice of the pie of tinnitus. Like this, mm -hmm. this is what I should focus on. And at the end of writing that book, which was really like me, an investigative journalism <laughs> look at my own experience and trying to understand like what happened to me and what did I do? I, I had like an afterthought. I was like, maybe this can become something. And I put in the back, like, if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, go to this website. And I put up a quick landing page. I didn't plan anything. I just, I didn't even really believe that anyone would take me up on that. And then like within like a month of the book launching, I got the first application. I like panicked and I had to scramble and, and I... <laughs> And, but, but now here we are like almost nine years later. Right. Um, and I've worked with like over a thousand people now wow. one on one from, from all over the world at, at, along the way I expanded and started working with Meniere's patients as well. I, I, I admittedly do a lot less of that than I do with tinnitus. I've, I've been able to help a lot of people with Meniere's, but I, with tinnitus, I have this incredibly high level of confidence that I can, I can help a person to dramatically improve their quality of life. And every case of Meniere's is so different. Like I, I know I can provide so much hope and tools to try and strategies, but it's like, you never know how far each, I never want any, I would never want anyone to feel like I couldn't deliver. So like, there's a part of me that always like was hesitant there, like, um, right. and careful not to overpromise. Um, but so, so tinnitus, the tinnitus coaching is really the bulk of, of my work these days. Um, it's like a very highly personalized thing. I spend a lot of time with my uh, with my clients where we kind of go through a person's story and and i can come up with sort of like a personalized plan 
for people to follow. Um, the, the sort of high level, my approach to tinnitus, I, I sort of take a high level, the high level overview is it's like three parts. It's at the center of it, you need some sort of habituation exercise, like daily practice that, that facilitates the habituation process. Uh, Tinnitus, like with in-ear maskers, that's one such strategy and it's in what's known as tinnitus retraining therapy. I teach a meditation-based strategy. I, we, I incorporate masking as well. But um, so getting that piece of the puzzle, like putting the engine in the car so the car can mm -hmm. start to go up the hill, uh, that's that's one piece of it. And, and, and there's a whole progression and, and a teaching there. The second part of it is teaching all kinds of tools and techniques and strategies for improving your coping and 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 managing the anxiety and the stress and to find relief in the moment in the short term. And then there's a long-term strategy because life happens and you never know when something's going to happen outside of your control that changes what you're hearing in your ears. And so ha you, having a long-term plan in place so that if, if something happens, you can deal with it effectively and you don't just end up kind of spiraling back to square one and starting over again. Uh, that that's so, so that's sort of how I help people and work with them. And, and, and on the Meniere side of things, it's a lot more of providing education and hope and just introducing as many tools and strategies and lifestyle management strategies, like everything I can for people to start experimenting with and try. So they at least are, can, can try things that are likely to work or, or more likely to work. And they don't have to just blindly, you know, stumble in the dark like I did. Uh, it's just endless trial and error to sort of figure out what, what worked for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've had a ton of success in doing it with, with people of all different walks of life uh, from all over the world. And I never imagined this is where my career would take me, but here I am, like, you know, eight years later, finding myself in a full-time career of helping people. And it's it's been wonderful. Like, I, I wouldn't awesome. have it any other way. Yeah. That's so cool. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for all you do, Glenn. I know that oh, my um, pleasure. I think our journey started around the same time, but we've never actually connected. I know we are past cross cross. I know. <laughs> and then I have uh, I, I wrote a letter for your book. Uh, oh, for the, the dear Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. A but I've not book. been aware of you for a while as well. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to be working together in a couple weeks at Life Rebound right. Live. That's exciting. Yep. yep. I hope everyone week. joins us. I'll be speaking on the tinnitus panel for for Life Rebalance Live this year. That's going to be a good time. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, I'm not sure if you listened to any of the episodes. I like to do um, whirlwind questions. It's just kind of yeah. to end it. it up. Awesome. Sure. All right. Well, fill in the blank. Vestibular disorders are hard. <laughs> like yeah, that's hard. the first word that comes <laughs> to mind. Challenging, challenging, but yeah, cha challenging, but not hopeless. That's right. That's, that's the best I got. Right. <laughs> Um, let's see. Now, this is just general because I know that your symptoms are on the low side, but um, mm -hmm. you feel symptoms coming on and you're trying to be brave. What's one of the first things that you do? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, the when when my symptoms are coming on, the first thing I do is a varying degree of what I call like some mini lifestyle cleanse. Just strip away everything that might be contributing to this and get back to the basics. Clean up my diet. Get back if I've been slacking on meditation. Get back into the meditation, breathing techniques, stress management. Um, address things I'm concerned about. Like really, just go back to the basics of self care. Um, yeah. Usually, my symptoms are increasing at a time where some aspect of my self care has fallen away, and and so any that that's that's like one thing I've gotten very good at. And I think is an important skill when living with chronic illness is being able to just slow down and back off when, when, you know, let off the gas when you need to. And look, I, I, I'm good at it, but I like everyone, it's hard. Like I always, especially cause like there, I go through periods where I can work and function at like a very high level. Like when mm -hmm. I'm, it's always, there's always this part of my brain. It's like, well, you probably could just push through and work on this and get it done. And, and, and yet like rest is, medicine and not laziness. And that's something that I've had to really drill into my brain over and over and over again. And I've got, and I've gotten good at it. Like, even if it's, yeah. if it's hard, like I'm able to let off the gas and slow down and, and, and kind of give myself a chance to, to breathe, give myself some room where I can, where I can get back to the yeah. basics of coping. Good. Yes. I know. We do tend to backslide a bit and have to <laughs> return to the basics. Yeah. I get that too. <laughs> yeah. What is one thing that people usually get wrong about you? Hmm. 
That's a good question. Well, I think, I don't know if people get this wrong, but, but not everybody that finds my work or sees me, you know, in a video here or there, like knows that I am a vestibular and tinnitus patient myself. Um, and I have been to hell and back with all of these symptoms. Um, I think that, you know, with Meniere's and with tinnitus, like there is this feeling that there's so much fear and suffering and there's so much that doesn't work and so much that people trying to like acting in bad faith, like, especially in the tinnitus world, like you, if you Google tinnitus supplements on Amazon, you'd think every one of those companies had discovered the cure and there is no cure yeah. for tinnitus. Right. Um, and so I just think like people have their guard up and their instinct is like anybody who's kind of trying to help people with, with a condition like this is just, you know, just greed and in it to, take advantage of people that are in a hard place. But right. I am a vestibular patient myself. Like I've, I have tried and failed countless times, like of all these different things that all of you have tried and failed at. And um, so I, I, that maybe that's not the direct answer to the question, but nope, that's I get it. That's, that's, that's great because I know that we do, there's so many um, trolls out there that you just don't know. You just don't know who to trust out there in the community, but I'd say you're one to trust. Your, your face is everywhere and <laughs> you come highly recommended. So um, what is one of your favorite vestibular friendly meals? Ooh, good question. So I, so, so lately my diet, like I, I, I try hard to eat like a healthy diet, but I, I haven't, I'm not following any like specific dietary restrictions at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. but, but back, back when I was, there was years and years where, where it was a major, like diet was one of my primary concerns. And rather than give a meal, maybe I'll give a, a tip specific, like something that I found very helpful because a lot of people, a lot of people just stop eating out. Um, and, and, and like, they'll just, they, they, they restrict their diet like endlessly. And, and that was something I was not willing to do. Like, I love food. I love going out to restaurants. I love eat, making good food and eating good food. And like, I was, so two things. One is like, what the, the type of restaurant that I always enjoyed the most was farm to table restaurants. Like farm to mm -hmm. table restaurants, everything is made to order. And I always mm -hmm. found that I could, it was like the most options. Like there was always, I would always be able to find something I could eat right. at every restaurant, even if it was just like, you know, salad with a piece of plain grilled chicken and you know balsamic vinegar there was always something i could eat um but at a far but at a like higher end and farm to table restaurants like i would it'd be able to eat almost anything and and you you know you you your your taste buds adapt when you when you cut sodium um so that's that's what comes to mind i never it wasn't there wasn't like a specific meal the other thing i did that really helped and i don't know how easy this would be for people when I, I was so young at the time, I wasn't cooking at all. Like I, and I, I wasn't eating healthy. And so like, I was able to solve all of these problems, including the sodium problem. But I, I by finding like a, a company, like a new, a small company that did, you know, a lot of these prepared meal delivery mm. service companies, I yes. found one that was like a newer company. And I said, Hey, listen, like I need to eat low sodium for this health problem. Like, can you accommodate that? And they were like, yeah, no problem. And so like, every, like three times, twice or three times a week, I would just have these like healthy, portioned low sodium meals delivered to my house that I would just reheat. And, and like for years, I like I, I would do those uh, like at least a couple times a week. So ha f That's try awesome. like finding ways to make the diet work for you. Like it, yeah, it's where I'm you glad still you enjoy said that, yourself Glenn. is key. That is, that is, I, you don't hear about that too often, but I actually have friends that um, because of health issues had to go to meal prep companies that deliver but they only did it a short amount of time because it taught them how to portion and how to prepare. Sure. So I'm lazy and I was young. So I think it was okay. just a, <laughs> like, had I done it now at this time, you know, I'm, I'm 37 now. Like if it, if it happened now, like I, I, it would, I would just get a sense of like, okay, I, I would do it until I got a hang of things. But, right. but then it was just like, Oh, it's just so much easier <laughs> to just have this all done for me. And yeah. it was like, at the time it was like, you'd think that would be ex incredibly expensive, but I was able, I mean, we were, it was like, seven dollars a meal maybe mm. like eight seven eight dollars a meal for like a super healthy perfectly portioned low sodium meal nice. and i just with lots of variety like it, i i didn't do it every meal but like having right. that as like an option i could fall back to delivered fresh at all the it's, again it's like all about just trying to simplify these things in your life sure. and find like what's the easiest option for for each individual no, person that's awesome. i never had like a go-to meal though like like in in worst case you know like this is this is what i fall back to i tried to keep it keep the variety there 
That's cool. Yeah. What is the last show that you binged and loved? The last show that I binged and loved was For All Mankind on Apple TV, which is a mm. phenomenal show. It's the premise is uh, what if Russia landed a man on the moon first and the space mm -hmm. race never ended? And, uh, and then every season they like jump forward 10 years and the, the, the CGI, everything, the acting, it is an unbelievably good show. I mean, everything yeah. Apple does is so high quality, but this was like yeah. on a whole nother level. And I literally just finished that recently. That was an excellent, nice. excellent show that I, I can't recommend enough for, for all <laughs> mankind. Yeah. Cool. What is your favorite book or novel? So favorite fiction is probably the book Dune which uh, the famous sci-fi book that there's now big blockbuster movies on. Um, yeah. Favorite nonfiction? I don't know if favorite, but the one that, that's coming to mind is a book called The, the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. So um, do, you know, do you know that one? I yeah, do. Like it's, 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 it's a phenomenal book for anyone who's doing any sort of creative work. And it's one that I read at least once a year. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, he sort of de describes this internal force that kind of makes it difficult to, to do things we know that are good for us, like, you know, getting to the gym and sitting down mm -hmm. to write that book or, you know, like, uh, it, you know, as what he calls like capital R resistance. And the idea is that like the professional, you show up and create the space where the creativity can happen. I don't know. It's an excellent book. And I've, Every time I'm working on a big project, I always reread that book as a, as a reminder. So those are those yeah, are two that come to mind. One. Each time I read it, I take something more away from it. Yeah, so totally. It's, it's, really good. it's an amazing book. It is. What is yeah. an activity that completely relaxes you? Completely relaxes me. So a few things keep coming to mind, but then I, I'm like, my other part of my brain is like, no, well, it's not totally relaxing. I, I love, uh, so meditation, obviously, and, and just actually like relaxation techniques always relax me very deeply. Like I've, I have, I'm, I have a very highly refined ability to calm myself down um, after years and years and years huh. of, of practice, but probably yeah. playing music. Like I play a lot of guitar and ukulele and, and that's something that, yeah, like if I'm, feeling anxiety like that'll that'll calm me down um i love cycling riding my bike like that calm that's relaxing though not exactly relaxing drive biking on the streets in florida um <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh yeah yeah so pro probably playing music cool oh great well and the last one today what are you extremely grateful for today <sighs> today well i am T today I'm 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 extremely grateful for my kids. But we we so I I have I have two kids. I have a five year old son and a and a fourteen month old daughter. And uh, my my wife is is healthy now. But when she was pregnant with my son, there was uh, she was she was diagnosed with breast cancer at seven months pregnant, and that oh was this gosh. whole crazy ordeal. Um, and we didn't know if we created embryos at the time and we didn't know if we would be able to, if she could bring those embryos to term or we knew we wanted more kids. We didn't know if it was going to be possible via conventional means. And uh, in, you know, uh, 14 months ago, we had our beautiful baby girl via Aww. surrogacy and uh, she's home sick today with an ear infection. And so, but I'm, 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 I'm just, I don't know. That That's what I'm most grateful for today that I have. She's, she's going to be, she's, she's getting better. And, you know, just having two kids, yeah. having a daughter, having these two kids that are healthy and well adjusted. That's what I'm most grateful for today. And my health, of course, like it's absolutely, there was no guarantee that I would end up in this place. I'm, I'm in now, like I'm, I'm extremely grateful and careful not to take any aspect of my health for granted. Like cer certainly not. Right. Well, thank you so much, Glenn, for sharing everything today. My pleasure. It was great to be here with you, Heather. Thank you so much for having me. We'll have to do it again sometime. Absolutely. What a great conversation. Now, please keep in mind, habituation is not going to happen overnight. Your job is to simply apply some of the lessons he spoke about today. And of course, if you need more information, pick up one of his best-selling novels, either Mind Over Meniere's, How I Conquered Meniere's Disease and Learned to Thrive, or Rewiring Tinnitus, How I Finally Found Relief from the Ringing in My Ears, or reach out to him directly. All the ways to do so are in the show notes. Whatever you do, 
Know that there are people in this community that will walk this path with you, so please don't give up. One more thing. I love that you are here and hitting the play button and sharing these episodes, but I have a huge favor to ask. So other warriors can find the show, make certain that not only are you subscribing, but that you are also leaving a review. This actually helps independent podcasters like myself to be found in the community. Next week, stay tuned for my recap of what I took away from Vita's Life Rebalance Live 2024 a couple weeks ago. If you have made it this far, I would like to thank you for being here. It's because of you that I continue to share these stories and connect with so many of you. Our community is growing every day, so be sure to be that person you needed at the beginning of your journey and lean on this community. If you know someone with an inspiring story, I would love to connect with them. See the ways to connect with me below and reach out. One final question and I'll let you go. Have you discussed your vestibular disorder or symptoms with your employer? I would love for you to leave me a voice message at www.speakpipe.com. Your responses will be shared in future episodes. If you'd like more information on vestibular disorders, visit the VITA website at www.vestibular.org. Remember to love and be gentle with yourself. Lean on this beautiful community and remember that healing is possible. I'll see you soon, warriors.